Ah, I see. Well, I'll show you. Well, Colin, uh, welcome once again. Thank you. Thanks very much for taking the time to talk to me. I'm um, talking today to Colin Batch, coach of the famous Black Sticks, just taken over as coach. And as always, I like to get uh, people's interpretation of the game and the growth of the game where their own particular philosophy is. So, Colin, um, tell me, what are the critical factors in creating a winning opportunity? <laughs> How long have we got? As long as you like. Yeah. <laughs> Look, there, there are many facets, but I think the, the biggest change in the modern game is the speed and the power of the game. And, uh, you know, they see constant interchange, which means that the um, speed of the, the match continues to increase. Players' fitness levels are extremely high, and uh, with the rule changes in modern sticks, um, the technique of players are extremely high. So the critical factors would be just well, you know, technique, the technical side of the game, fitness level of the game, and of course tactically you've uh, got to be on top of uh, the changing nature of the game because we we see players that come on and off the ground and uh, the pitches change. So teams okay. are sometimes in uh, full press, sometimes they're in half court, so constantly changing. Probably those specialist aspects of the game, which you probably refer to then. How important is it in the modern game to have a specialist right for the Well, yeah, you know, it's very important. You know, it's interesting we will see uh, how Colin goes in the tournament here. And they haven't got a specialist, so yeah, we'll see what they can develop. But look, I think all teams strive to have one, um, but the players still has to be a, a very high level player in the um, match. If they're not at that level, then best drag flicker around and uh, still having the liability. So again, it still gets back to the elements that I was talking about. Okay, in most teams there's like, several players more or less select themselves and then there's another group that's going to come into the team and then eventually the coach is left with his decision of these probably two or three or whatever players and you know, eventually it comes down to two players. One player is going to be in and one player is not going to be in. And there's probably not a whole lot in there. How do you select one player over another player? Well, I guess it depends what else you've got in your team. And, you know, uh, it could be that you want an extra striker or an extra defender, or you might want someone that can play two or three different lines. So, um, it, sometimes it's just a gut feel. That, um, I know some of the coaches do talk about that. Just They really haven't got a an outright reason for it. Um, for me, it would come down to who is the best mentally prepared. Um, quite often I see that as a, an, an underused way of assessing players. And, uh, I, I feel that that's, uh, you know, in the cut and thrust of a tournament, you go up and down and you come up, uh, across a lot of obstacles. And uh, if you're mentally prepared and you're, um, you can deal with those changes, then for me, that would be the person that I want to be. Um, how do you then motivate these players? You've got your team, your squad. How do you go about motivating them? Well, I think most young players like the challenge of playing international sport. And, you know, we see a lot of them like the big, big stage, uh, modern technology these days. You've got Twitter and Facebook and all those sorts of things, and they seem to love being on those mediums. So um, I don't think it's that hard to motivate a lot of them. Um, but to get there, they've got to do all the training and all the hard work, and uh, you know, there's no shortcut. Okay, you've got the squad, you've motivated them, and they've motivated themselves with their Twitter account. How do you criticise somebody if something's not going quite right the way you'd like it to, and you've got to do relay that message? That? Yeah, well, you know, it's a, it's a different way, a uh, different approach to many, many players. Sometimes it's, uh, you've got to tell them the reality. And uh, that can vary from time to time. Um, you know, it's, you can't. I don't think with the modern player just come out and uh, maybe be extremely negative. I think uh, you know, what worked 20 years ago doesn't work. You've got to talk and, and point uh, the player in a different direction and, and a different focus. I think that's the most important thing. And you talked a little bit about moving across the lines just a second ago. And we used to see old style hockey balls defenders with him. Now we've got this player that's a little bit through. How do you develop that all round play? Well, we see, uh, we actually coach uh, strikers uh, with defensive qualities, we coach defenders with attacking qualities. So when we when we are training, having a training session, we're, we're te teaching similar techniques to forwards and defenders. So 
I think there's a natural instinct for players to come forward. There should be a natural instinct for the players to defend as well. So that's the that's the mixture that uh, we constantly get, and it's, it's started on the training. Really. Um, during the game, we find that the attacking short corner is reviewed constantly, and the instructions come from the bench. On the defending short corner, do you review that during the game and send instructions out? Not to the same extent. Um, we do plan according to uh, prior to the match, we do a lot of scouting, every team does. Uh, there will be one or two, three options, and we're very reliant on what we see at the top of the circle. So we're more reacting to what uh, we see, whereas the attack is uh, probably a surprise. I think many times we see a, a family corner successful because it's a little bit of a surprise. Okay. If a player receives a ball on the field, what's the very first thing they should do? Well, I hope they've already done it, but uh, they should be pre-scanning <laughs> before they get it. You know, I thought that very, very long time ago, and it's still the core part of uh, any team sport. Okay, an uh, attacking player gets the ball. Do you have any rules about when they should take on the defence, or lay the ball off, or do you just leave it to the player? Well, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to create space in the bottom of the game. Uh, but if it's there, it's a one-on-one, -on -one, there's space in behind, there's a good time to, take it, to have a, um, to go for it an elimination. So I see that as uh, one for the strikers to uh, recognise. If you're in the corner and there's two or three, four defenders around you, this is what I'm trying to do. Okay, finally, we're Champions Trophy 2012. Uh, another rule change this year, as we see. Hopefully we've had quite a number of over uh, the years. If you could make a change to one of the rules in the game, what would it be and why? Well, uh, I think the self-pass rule is a really good one. Yeah. And again, it adds to the... I know I'm not quite answering your question. That's fine. Self-pass. The self-pass rule is a really good one for the sport. Uh, it's creating more attacking options and it penalises the defence. And uh, that's what we want to see in hockey. Uh, Open so it's not, for me, it's not been. It needs to uh, have you know, five or six goals scored every game. I mean, it's the flow of the game that needs to. We, we need to continually enhance that. So, I guess, given that the players are so fit these days, and they've got interchange and they get up and down the pitch so quickly, that maybe we should look at uh, reducing some of the players. Okay. That would be the, the one I would get. Colin Bates, thank you very much for that. Thank you for your thoughts and uh, good luck with the rest of the championship. Okay, thank you.